Let's review the Unit 8 of AP Biology on Ecology in just about 15 minutes. Hey guys, this is Mikey with Avo Prep Academy, and on this channel, we review AP Bio content. In today's video, we'll be tackling the very last unit of AP Biology, which spans several chapters, all covering various parts of ecology. I've broken down today's video so that we can take a fairly methodical, bottom-up approach to reviewing all the things that you need to know for this section. First, we'll review the big ideas in ecology. Two, we'll review population ecology three, community ecology, and four, ecosystems ecology. Let's begin with the big ideas. The first big idea begins with defining ecology. Ecology is the study of organisms and their environment. And generally speaking, this large topic is divided into varying scopes of investigation. Here we see a very common hierarchy of ideas in ecology with global ecology and landscape ecology at the top. But for the purpose of AP biology, we pay closer attention to the next three, which spans from ecosystems ecology, community ecology, then down to population ecology. Here, just note that ecosystems can include living and non-living things interacting together, while communities include all of the living things interacting together. And of course, population ecology pertains to a group of individuals within a single species interacting together. So the name of the game in studying ecology is interactions. Another big idea that we need to know is how the patterns of environments are formed by their geographical distribution. Now, I didn't really go into too much details about biomes in my other videos, but I think it's worthwhile briefly mentioning that there are many types of biomes in the world. And if you've ever played Minecraft, which I presume most of you guys have, you'd already be pretty familiar with the ideas of biomes, be it rainforests, deserts, or the Arctic tundra. The only thing that I'll mention here is that these systems are largely shaped by the types of plants that form the primary producer class. And in turn, the types of plants and the amount of their productivity is directly determined by the amount of precipitation, be it rain or snow, and the annual temperature a particular environment harbors. Great, so now that we have these biomes, let's discuss the third big idea in ecology, which is that organisms have intricate relationships with varying components of our environment. And because species evolved in their respective environments, there are many biological features and behaviors that track environmental factors. For instance, we have examples such as the circadian rhythm, where organisms are capable of maintaining an internal clock that keeps a rough 24-hour cycle. But if you really think about it, the reason that the biological rhythm tracks a day's length is that our planet rotates on its own axis every 24 hours. So it's pretty clear to see that our physical environment shapes much of what we do and how we've evolved. Now that about sums up the big themes in ecology. So now let's go into the specifics of population ecology and move our way upward. In population ecology, we begin by defining the term population. A population is a group of individuals of a single species living in the same general area. Once again, the main idea here is to investigate the relationship between individuals individuals of a single species, and that really boils down to reproduction. As such, we are primarily focused on the dynamics of how populations can grow and shrink. And while the mathematical equations that model population growth is useful to know, the actual May exam rarely, if ever, asks you to do the calculations. Rather, keep in mind that the populations can grow when intrinsic factors like birth rate and immigration rate are higher than the death rate and the emigration rate, and vice versa. And if you want to know more about the equations and the calculations involved in this section, there's a link in the description below that takes you to my video that dives much deeper into those particular calculations. But what's really important is how the population growth can be affected by extrinsic factors that have the capacity to affect those birth and death rates. So to review these factors, let's first take a closer look at a common model of population growth in biology called the logistics growth model. Here you're seeing how most populations grow their sizes in a finite environment. Growth usually starts off slowly due to fewer mating pairs, but as the population grows and grows, it enters an exponential phase. However, due to factors that limit this population size, the growth rate begins to decline and eventually plateaus. Now let's first define that asymptote as K, or the carrying capacity 
of a population. Now, there are actually two types of factors that can limit population growth. The first kind, known as the density dependent factors, are factors that have a greater and greater impact on the population as it gets bigger. So, for instance, resource limitation, whether it be food or light, can be a bigger issue when the population is bigger than when it's smaller. We can also add things like the buildup of toxins or spreading of infectious diseases to that list. On the other hand, we also have density independent factors that can periodically limit the population size without being contingent on the size of that population at that time. These typically Include natural disasters that can take out a great portion of the population, regardless of how big that population may be. Knowing this distinction is more important for the exam than the math formula. Now, in population ecology, we also talk about distribution patterns of populations. We have three types: clump distribution that usually results from patchy resources or defensive behaviors, random distribution that forms when seeds are randomly windblown across a field, or uniform distribution that typically stems from territorial organisms forming their little spheres of Influence that don't overlap. We also should be familiar with the types of survivorship curves we see playing out. Here, the x-axis represents the relative lifespan of a species, while the y-axis represents the proportions or numbers of individuals in a population that survives to that time. Type one curve demonstrates high survival rates for infants and the young that eventually tapers off to a relatively high mortality rate experienced toward the end of the expected lifespan. Type two curve shows a consistent rate of mortality throughout the lifespan. Of the species, while type three curve shows a high infant mortality rate with lower mortality if they survive past a certain point. All of the examples are shown in the graph, and you can always ask Google or ChatGPT for more examples of species that exhibit various types of survivorship patterns. And while we're on the topic of patterns, let's also discuss how organisms may strategize their reproductive event or events throughout their lives. In semiparous organisms, we see one huge reproductive event with the individual typically dying soon thereafter. Salmon and agave are great examples of this. In yet other species, we see iteroparity, where they have multiple reproductive events throughout their lives. Just make sure to note that these behaviors are shaped by evolution, carefully selected to maximize the success of their offspring in the future. And with that, let's move on to community ecology, which probably carries the greatest weight when it comes to the AP exam. Now, a community is. A population of different species living close enough to interact, and boy, are there a lot of interactions. So let's talk about these interactions and use this type of convention to discuss how these interactions affect the two species involved. First, we have competition. Competition is a minus-minus interaction when two different species coexist in an environment while competing for the same set of resources. These species are typically said to have overlapping niches, and in many cases, we observe competitive exclusion, wherein the less competitive of the two species goes locally extinct. This is very important to keep in mind when you see two population graphs doing well while grown independently, while both struggling when grown together, with one species generally crashing due to that exclusion. Now, there is this other possibility. That you might want to keep in mind, and it's called niche partitioning. Niche partitioning occurs when the two competing species evolve to occupy the polar ends of their respective niches to avoid that competition. This generally leads to the two species coexisting together, no longer sharing a similar niche, but rather specializing into their own niches. Next, we have predation and herbivory. This is an obvious plus and minus relationship. Things to note about predation are numerous adaptations that predators and prey have developed to make themselves better predators and better defenders. Let's list some of them with picture examples: cryptic coloration, so basically camouflage; aposematic coloration, also known as warning colorations, to showcase their poison or venom; stereo vision for better gauging of distances, and monoscopic vision with greater field of view. For detection of predators, I'm sure you can think of way more. But what's interesting is how certain patterns become common across multiple species in conveying a similar message. In Mullerian mimicry, we see equally unpalatable species sharing very similar warning colorations as sort of a biologically universal signal. And in Batesian mimicry, we see cheaters taking on the coloration of dangerous organisms without actually developing any potent venom or poisons of their own. Let's also talk about some more intimate relationships that we call. Symbiosis. In symbiosis, we see mutualism, wherein both species benefit from this plus-plus interaction. Common examples include nitrogen-fixing bacteria in root nodules of legumes that provide biologically available nitrogen while receiving sugars in return. We also see mycorrhizal fungi providing additional surface area for plant roots to uptake more nutrients, again receiving sugars in return. Now we also have commensalism, where one species benefits while the other is unaffected. 
Cowbirds flying around bisons to pick up insects that get kicked up is a great example. Lastly, we have parasitism with endo and ectoparasites that make home either on the inside or outside of their hosts respectively. Just note that parasites do require hosts in order to survive and propagate, and some intricate evolutionary relationships have evolved and created fairly complex life cycles for many parasites. Now that we've discussed most of the possible interactions between species, let's talk about trophic relationships. That is to say, who's eating whom? We can look at this topic from two different models. First, we see the energy flow model with the primary producers at the bottom, providing nutrients to the levels above, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and beyond. The main thing to know here is the 10% rule, where we generally see only about 10% of the available energy moving up to the next level, explaining why there are only a handful of predators, but a ton of herbivores. Now we can also see food webs where more complex relationships can be shown. Here, it's all about predicting outcomes when you change something about the food web. For instance, we may see cascading effects where the removal of one species can negatively impact the species that feed on it and the one that feeds on that species and so on. Note that in these relationships, we often see the term keystone species coming up as well. These are species that have an abnormally large impact on the community such that their removal can change the system drastically. Beavers and their dams is a great example of that. Now we also have this very important concept of biodiversity or the level of diversity that exists within a community that comes up here too. Biodiversity is measured as a function of both species richness and species evenness. That is to say that we want a lot of species but also a good representation of each species in the community. A high species diversity is correlated with greater resilience against harmful effects on that community, such as pathogens that may affect one or more of the species, or even invasive species. And speaking of invasive species, don't forget that many invasive species do well because they produce a lot of offspring, grow fast, and are very opportunistic. And most importantly, they tend to lose their own enemies, such as predators or herbivores, when they leave or escape their natural habitat and take over over a new area. As mentioned before, communities with low species diversity are going to be more impacted by these invaders, sometimes even turning into monocultures that invasive species completely take over. And there's still more to do in community ecology, but in this last part, let's talk about disturbance. Disturbances like fire or floods can have a positive impact on a community by recycling nutrients and providing opportunities for various species to occupy the area too. In the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, we see just that. And on the exam, there are many instances where we even see fire adaptations coming out. For instance, plant seeds that respond to smoke, knowing that a fire had cleared out above ground vegetation for greater access to light has been an idea that has been repeated on this test. And let's end community ecology on this. This. Succession. See, on the exam, you need to recognize ecological succession when you see it. Here, we see two kinds of succession. Primary succession is the restart of an ecosystem from bare rock. We first have lichens and mosses that slowly break the rocks down back into soil, followed by grasses and annual plants. We eventually get shrubs, which are replaced by trees, which are then replaced by more trees. But the trees that come a little bit later are the more competitive, shade-tolerant ones. And in secondary succession, we begin with a disturbance that leaves the soil intact. So skipping the first part where we break the rocks down, and you got yourself a secondary succession. Things to know here are that the primary succession can take way longer than secondary succession, and that biological interactions occurring at each phase sets the stage for the next phase to occur. Finally, we get to ecosystems ecology, but don't worry too much here as much of what's discussed have already been covered before in the earlier part of this video. For instance, this is the part where they actually go into details about the 10% rule, but you know all about that already. The only thing I'll mention here is that the ecosystems ecology that we're discussing is more interested in flux of substances between biological and non-biological systems. So for instance, we see the role of decomposers being explored with dead matter being recycled into substrates that would eventually be reabsorbed by plants for synthesis. Of course, bacteria and fungi play a huge role here. We also learned that nutrients cycle through varying systems with the water cycle, carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen cycle might be worth noting because we see so much much nitrogen in our atmosphere as that N2 gas that plants can't actually use at all. So again, we learned that nitrogen fixing bacteria and even lightning can play a role in creating substrates like nitrites and nitrates that are in fact biologically available. This of course links to the greater idea of symbiotic 
nitrogen-fixing bacteria that we've mentioned before. Also note that much of our human activity has messed around with these cycles, particularly the carbon cycle. Increased carbon dioxide due to anthropogenic sources have increased the temperatures across many systems, which the exam wants you to know will impact the distribution of species. For instance, species may move higher up in latitude or even altitude to avoid the warming environment. Now, this is especially important because that warming is typically linked to the idea of enzyme activity, wherein too much heat can cause denaturation. And AP Bio just loves to ask about that. And that about sums up most of what we need to know for this final unit of AP Biology. By the time you're watching this video, I'm sure you're simultaneously preparing for the May exam. So be sure to check out all of our old review content to refresh your memory on the older topics. And if you found this video helpful, be sure to click that like button and subscribe to the channel to keep on top of what we're doing here. And most importantly, share this video with someone named Hannah because her name is a palindrome and that's kind of cool. This has been Mikey with Ava Prep Academy. We'll see you in the next video.